Hello everyone, it's Doug McGuff with Ultimate Exercise, Body by Science, DrMcGuff.com. This time I'd like to talk to you about hypertrophy. Recently on a podcast I heard someone make the assertion that high volume training was for hypertrophy and high intensity low volume training was for getting, sp getting strong without necessarily getting big. And I want to address why that's a ridiculous notion. Um, as a background, my interest in resistance exercise began purely as an interest in growing muscle and um, hypertrophy as the goal. And as such, I can tell you I have done everything there is to try to invoke more hypertrophy. I've done high volume training like a la Arnold. I have done high intensity training in the early days of Arthur Jones when it was 19 to 23 sets per workout done three times a week. I've done four-way split. I've done Mike Mincer's um, ideal routine. I've done Mike Mincer's consolidated routine. I've done negative only. Um, I've done hypertrophy specific training. Um, I've done every imaginable protocol and the only thing that's made any appreciable difference in a incremental increase in my level of hypertrophy was when I first did Ellington Darden's upside down bodybuilding and the real reason that that worked was I went down to no more than eight exercises per workout. And then the second time that I had another spurt in growth was after visiting Greg Anderson and going down to five sets per workout. Um, beyond that, nothing made a difference. And I think in a recent post on his site, uh, Drew Bay, made the point that if you were able to clone yourself seven different times and you applied seven different training protocols over a lifetime to all those genetic clones of yourself, in the end, you would end up with the same result in regard to hypertrophy. And I think this is really true and it really is the case. Um, and as a consequence, I really think you need to think of hypertrophy as an undesired side effect for your body. So the resistance exercise, the strength training, the intensity of the exercise is necessary but not sufficient to produce impressive levels of hypertrophy. What is sufficient to produce impressive levels of hypertrophy is the right genetics in the right genetic environment and nothing else nothing else matters. If you want to see what good discipline across a lifetime means in terms of hypertrophy, again, visit Drew Bay's site or go on YouTube and look at his video about his 30-year experience with HIT. He has gotten very, very lean over the course of the past year, and he compares himself at age 20 to age 50, and the photos are impressive for the degree of muscle mass that he is had as an increase. But make no mistake that hypertrophy is tolerated as a side effect by your body. It is not a goal, it is not a primary purpose. And hypertrophy is heavily negatively regulated for multiple reasons. One is just the metabolic expense of skeletal muscle. Um, myostatin is um, a protein encoded by a gene, GDF8, that puts a limiter or a ceiling on how much muscle hypertrophy you can have. And if you remove that governor in an animal, you will have a massively muscled animal, like a bully whippet. You can Google the term Wendy, the bully whippet, and look at what these animals look like who have never lifted a weight a day in their life because you've lifted the genetic ceiling off of there. There's many reasons other than just the metabolic expense. One is, as you get bigger, the mechanics of actin and myosin sliding over each other if the filaments get too thick gets compromised. On a more macroscopic scale, the relationship of the muscle fibers to the tendon and the joint they attach to can start to become unfavorable where there's a diminishing marginal utility for adding on any size. There's also the problem of certain structures of muscle are not prone to hypertrophy. Pinnate muscles, meaning that they have their fibers arranged like a feather, are not very amenable to hypertrophy at all. You can very much strengthen 
the interosseous muscles and the lumbrical muscles in your hand by doing crush gripping and pinch gripping. But have you ever seen anyone's hand hypertrophy as a result? No, because these are muscles that are designed to be in very tight spaces. So because of their fiber structure, and also probably because of regional myostatin signaling, they don't grow because if you grew in your hand, you would have a non-functional hand that couldn't grip anything. Also, there's the issue if the muscle becomes too big, then you have a problem with diffusion of nutrients into the muscle and diffusions of waste products out of the muscle. So there are multiple different reasons why a muscle can be negatively regulated in terms of the degree of hypertrophy that you can have. And for the people that are still going to maintain that a training style will dictate higher levels of hypertrophy, I would like to offer you the example out of the book Pumping Iron where it describes Arnold checking his calf, the best calf in the sport, in the mirror of Gold's Gym, while in the other corner of Gold's Gym, Bill Grant, another bodybuilder, is doing set after set after set of calf raises and cannot get his calves to budge. So Bill Grant in the 1970s was a bodybuilder that was known for having the best biceps in the business. But using the same training protocol that he used to produce the very best biceps in the business could not produce calves to save himself. And it's the same protocol in the same person. So hypertrophy can be negatively regulated in one muscle group within one person and there's not a thing that you can do about it. And you have to understand that for the vast, vast majority of the population, their entire body is like Bill Grant's calves. Did Bill Grant's calves get bigger as a result of his training? Probably so. Did they look better? Probably so. Were they ever impressive? No, they absolutely weren't. And that's true for most people throughout their body. Other bodybuilders of that era were just the opposite. Chris Dickerson had really kind of short baseball shaped biceps and he wasn't really well known for his arms, but his calves were absolutely the best in the business at the time. But what's not known is he is one of two surviving identical triplets, I believe. Maybe it was twins. But Arthur Jones makes note of this in uh, training bulletin number two, that he had some of the best calves in the business. But what wasn't known was that his twin brother, the still surviving brother, had even better calves than him and never trained them a day in his life. Boyer Co. trained and trained and trained trying to get six-pack abs, but he never had the connective tissue divisions to produce a six-pack. So Boyer Co. was always known for his abdominal muscles not looking that great. So no matter, even if you're the best of the best, those genetic limitations still exist. Now, the amount of performance-enhancing drugs that are used are overcoming these limitations by severely lifting the governor off all muscle groups, but now they all look identical. So we have to understand that we resistance train in the best way that we know how, and the hypertrophy that we get is what we're gonna get, and that's that. Because to our body, hypertrophy is an undesired side effect that's heavily negatively regulated. So in my opinion, the best thing to do is train hard, train brief, train smart, don't get injured. As long as you're doing those things, you're doing everything that you can do. So for drmcguff.com, ultimate exercise, body by science, go out in the real world and do some dope shit.